All right, I think it's recording. Um, all right, so this is Dr. Mark Hyman, and he's talking about how food heals us and connects. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. I'm a family physician and eight time number one New York Times bestselling author. I'm also an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate for real, whole, unprocessed foods. And I've dedicated my career to identifying and addressing the root causes of chronic illness through a groundbreaking whole systems approach known as functional medicine. Now here's the breakthrough. We now know that food is medicine and that most chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, the chronic diseases that now account for 84% of our $3.8 trillion in healthcare costs are mostly caused by bad food. And the good news is, can be cured by good food. And that is why what you put at the end of your fork is more powerful than anything you'll ever find in a prescription bottle. Every single bite of your food influences your genes, your hormones, immune system, your brain chemistry, and even your gut flora or microbiome. Each bite of food can bring you vibrant health or lead you on the road to disease. And so the question everybody's talking about is, what should I eat? Should you eat like a caveman and stick to meat and vegetables and fruit and avoid all grains and dairy? Or maybe you should eat like a gorilla and eat only vegetables. Or maybe you should eat low carb or low fat. How about vegan or paleo? What about food labels and calorie counts? What about all those health claims on the label? Do calories matter? What's the right diet, <laughs> okay? Making sense of all of it can be very confusing. And the food and the diet industry would like to keep it that way since they make billions of dollars, actually about $1 trillion by keeping you guessing. So what's good for them is bad for you. Now, Plate by Zumba takes the guessing out of eating and cooking. You can actually eat anything. It only has one rule, just eat food. Simple, real, fresh, delicious, nutrient-packed foods that are easy to cook. Foods that come from a farmer's field, not a factory. Foods that travel the shortest distance from the field to your fork. That is what we should eat. Now, unfortunately, most of us never learned what real food is. So just in case, I'm gonna lay it out for you. The key to health is to focus on real food. What do I mean by real food? Anything that is whole, fresh, and unprocessed. Stuff that your great grandmother would recognize as food. A chicken, a vegetable, a bean, a nut, a grain, a fruit, an egg. Everything else is fake food that depletes our energy and our health. Real food heals, real food nourishes. Now, as you'll see, that list of real food is pretty short. <laughs> Unfortunately, many of us are still not well acquainted with real food. We have outsourced our cooking to the food industry, to packaged, processed, and prepared convenience foods, and to fast food restaurants and convenience stores. But there is nothing convenient about the disconnected, sluggish, slothful, foggy, depressed way you feel, or the diseases you get, and the medications you have to take when you go for convenient food. See, food is medicine, and it can hurt you or it can heal you. It can nourish you or it can make you sick. The choice lies in our own hands. Now, here's a question many people ask. Is eating real food more expensive and more time consuming? Well, we've been led to believe that eating well is expensive and that cooking your own food takes way too much time. But the facts are quite different. See, the research shows that you can eat well and in less time for less money than buying processed foods. Yes, calorie for calorie, a big gulp or a two liter bottle of soda is cheaper than broccoli. But if you count the amount of nutrients to the amount of calories, the soda hits a big fat zero, while the broccoli is a super dense nutrient extravaganza. See, the problem with thinking that junk food is cheaper is that first we are eating an extra 500 calories per person a year compared to 30 years ago, and second, those calories have no nutritional value, 
They are toxic and they cause obesity and disease. Real food tastes better, it's more nourishing, and it's more satisfying, and it will eliminate all of your cravings and hunger. I think you'll quickly find that as you start ditching the processed foods and you buy more whole foods, that you actually spend less money on food overall. See, processed foods, fast foods, sugary coffee drinks, and other convenience foods take a hit on our health and our wallets. But we rarely tally up how much those things really cost us. The healthy food is expensive myth doesn't add up. Real nourishing food actually costs less than processed stuff. And in the bigger picture of our health, it becomes a much better bargain. Now let's review the program. You'll find that our program neatly divides the foods into two categories, essential plants and essential calories. Beneath each group, you're gonna find your most optimal and least optimal choices for health and weight loss. I chose each of these based on numerous criteria, including nutrient density, fiber, antioxidants, and what we call the glycemic impact, which is how fast something raises your blood sugar. Essential plants comprises the carbohydrate category. Now, as you'll see, some overlap. For example, legumes are carbohydrates, but they also contain good amounts of protein and fiber and are more slowly digested than refined carbs. So let's briefly take a look at each category. In the first category, you'll find fruit. Now among the best choices include whole, lower glycemic fruits like berries. A few might surprise you. You may not know, for example, that avocados and coconuts are actually fruits but they're actually among your best choices. And the second category are vegetables. Anything in green is basically an all you can eat food. These powerhouses are loaded with nutrients, fiber and antioxidants. The third category includes grains. You always wanna choose gluten-free grains if possible and anything that starts with GF signifies it's a gluten-free grain. Now last in the essential plants category are legumes or beans. Now these also double as an excellent vegetarian source of protein. In the next bracket are the essential calories. These include fat and protein and other foods, including my favorite, chocolate. Now in the red category, you're gonna find sugar and processed meat. Processed meat is a great example of bad fat. Sugar is just empty calories that I'm gonna explain can become addictive and contribute to obesity and disease. In fact, it's the biggest cause of obesity and chronic disease. Now again, I don't want you to get overwhelmed with all this information. I'm gonna cover everything in much more detail in future modules. Now this program divides essential plants and essential calories into green, orange, or red categories to determine the best and the least optimal sources. Altogether, it provides a simple blueprint about what foods to choose and what foods to avoid. Now, here's an overview of the program. Pulling the essential categories together with our program is actually really simple once you get the hang of it. The majority of the foods will be vegetables. You'll eat about 50 to 75% non-starchy veggies, and another 25% will be protein, either healthy animal or vegetable proteins like nuts, seeds, and beans. The remaining 25% will be healthy starches like non-gluten whole grains, beans, starchy veggies, including sweet potatoes, winter squash, small russet or fingerling potatoes, which have much less starch than regular potatoes. You can also have a side of berries or low glycemic fruits, and you'll choose water or caffeine-free herbal hot or iced teas to drink. Using this model, you'll plug in the foods from the green category, either the essential plants or the essential calories. You'll eat the orange category foods sparingly or not at all. And you'll avoid the red category, particularly for weight loss. This makes choosing the right foods in the right amounts simple and effortless. Now, when you complete these modules, you're gonna have a basic understanding about what foods to eat, which ones to avoid, and most importantly, why you should eat or avoid them. Now, when in doubt, just go back to what I said at the very beginning, just eat real, whole, fresh food. Very simple, very easy. You can do it. Okay. 
So lots of information there to, um, but as a, uh, just as a uh, little recap, let me share. So here's our recap. Food is medicine. Chronic diseases are caused by bad foods and they can be cured by good foods. So you can make food very powerful and you can change your life, you can change your family's life, you can change your friends' lives if you just learn how to make food a powerful medicine. And it's quite simple. You can eat real, simple, whole foods that come from nature. What I tell people is when you are thinking about what you can eat, Think about the fact that they should have one ingredient and that's whatever that food is, chicken. So if you think chicken versus chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets is gonna be processed. It's gonna be chopped up chicken, ground up chicken mixed with some flour or maybe some eggs and maybe some sodium, some salt and other things and then coat it with the eggs and flour mixture or something like that. And you dip them and you fry them in oil. So now you've got a basic food, chicken, that you have now transformed into a processed food, chicken nuggets. So real, whole, simple foods that come from nature. That's what you wanna eat. You, if, if we had our way, um, the best way that we can eat, it would be, we would farm, and grow our vegetables. We would raise our own animals, our pigs, our hogs, or, or cows, or whatever it is that you, or chickens. Or you would go fishing and catch your fish, catch your, your seafood, or go hunting, shoot a deer, or whatever <laughs> that you eat. But those that's how we were supposed to eat. Whole, fresh, and unprocessed foods. And I always say, I think about my grandmother, uh, my great, my, my great uh, grandmother, or my grandmother lived to be 104 years, 105 years old. She was gonna be 106 on May 4th of this year, but she died in um, February. But there were certain foods that she would never ever eat. She never ate cereal because she didn't know what cereal was. And she, she wouldn't eat spaghetti. And we'd say, come on, grandma, just try it, just try it. She wouldn't eat it because she didn't recognize those things as food. And so that's what you have to think about. What would your grandmother say? What would your great grandmother say about some of the foods that you're eating? Would she even recognize it as real food? If it's not real whole unprocessed food it's going to take our energy, it's going to deplete our health. It's going to cause chronic diseases. So clean eating, what is it? What is clean eating? If you look at these pictures, you can see these are definitely foods that we should never consume, sodas. I, and most people know that once they stop drinking sodas, they end up losing 10 pounds, 15 pounds right away because soda is nothing but sugar. A lot of anything in a, in a bag, a box, some type of container that you're buying out of the grocery store, it's probably not going to be good for you. And so what do those particular foods lead? You become overweight or obese. You develop type 2 diabetes. You develop sleep apnea. And people don't realize people die from sleep apnea. I used to work in organ transplant um, here in Washington, D.C. area. And we had so many donors, organ donors, who died in their sleep. They died from sleep apnea. Their breathing cut off while they were sleeping. Osteoarthritis. I, every, every woman, and I, in my gym, we focus primarily on women. Um, we do have a few men who come every once in a while, but mostly it's all women. But I don't know of any woman who's ever walked in my door who said, oh, my knees are great. They always say, I got bad knees. So I'm not gonna be able to do those squatting. I'm not gonna be able to jump around like that. I have bad knees. That's what I hear all the time. 
And so, you know, I had one lady, she was probably 50, she's about, well, she's about 64 now. But the first time she came to my class, she says, um, I just came here to support my friend. I'm taking this class with my friend. Um, I've got bad knees. I can't do squatting. I can't do any jumping. So don't expect me to. And I said, listen, it's your class. You do you. You know, if you can't jump, then don't jump. Just keep moving. That's all that I want you to do. Her friend stopped coming and she continued to come because she enjoyed the classes so much. And then I remember it's probably about six months after she had started. She said, Rosa, I want you to see something. And I said, what? And she squatted down like in that little that little girl position when you squat down and you play in, you know, uh, Jack Ross or something like that. She squatted all the way down like that. And she said, I can't believe I am able to do this. But what we do is we strengthen the muscle around the joints. Yolanda is a prime example <laughs> because, um, and I don't know if I, I, I shared a video of her yesterday because it was her birthday, her 67th birthday. And she's dancing and she got down low, all the way down. And I remember when she first joined Brick House, she would barely bend her knees. Right, Yolanda? <laughs> you can unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, you wasn't supposed to tell that. <laughs> I'm telling it all, I'm telling it. But Yolanda got down, down, down to the ground. <laughs> dancing and I first said tell everybody how old you are I already knew but and she says no I'm not gonna tell my age I'm not gonna tell my age I said tell your age because I want these 20 30 40 year olds to see this is what taking care of your health looks like so she finally said I'm 67 <laughs> and she's dancing but yes osteoarthritis that's a major issue for um, being overweight, being obese. You, you can have um, gallbladder disease, fatty liver disease. And most people think, oh, fatty liver disease is from drinking too much alcohol. Most people who have fatty liver disease does not even drink alcohol. They don't even drink alcohol. It's from the sugar. It's from the sugary foods, the sodas, the candy bars, the cakes, the pies, things like that. And that what is what caused fatty liver disease but it can be reversed. And believe it or not, fatty liver disease can be reversed in about 35 days. You can regenerate your liver within 35 days. So if your doctor ever tells you that, you say, no, okay, because they're gonna say, oh, well, you know, we, we probably need to go in and do some surgery and remove some of the fat off of your liver, but it's gonna sc cause scar tissue and it's gonna come back. You say, no, 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 I, I got something for this. I, I've got something for this. I'm gonna work on this myself and I'll reverse this. And then go back in in a couple of months and, and have them check your blood sugar, blood your, your blood level again, do your blood work again. And they'll, they'll be amazed like, what? How did, what did you do? In Stafford, these doctors here, they tell my ladies all the time, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because your numbers are improving every single time you come but we focus not just on the gym atmosphere of working out, doing Zumba, taking you know dumbbell classes or anything like that. We, we focus on that plus the nutrition piece too. High cholesterol can be reversed. High blood pressure can be re reversed. Heart disease, strokes can be prevented. So we wanna make sure that we are using food as medicine and not as poison. So we're going to talk about um, carbs. Most people hear about low carb diets. Oh, I can't eat carb. I can't eat carbohydrates. You know that's bad for me. Uh, it'll raise my blood sugar level. Well, carbs have a bad reputation because most people associate carbs with pasta, white pasta, white rice, white bread white sugar, yes, white potatoes. Those are carbohydrates, but those are considered um, simple carbohydrates that and immediately as you eat them, it turns to sugar. The starch in them turns to sugar 
and your body when it your the your body is not able to burn off that sugar so it, guess what the sugar is stored as body fat and your body says, I'll deal with this later. So when you're eating, you know, those sugary desserts and you're just, you know, oh, we're having a good time. We've got our, our pies, we've got our cakes, we've got our cookies. It's all fine and dandy. Your body says, okay, I'll just pack that away. And depending on how your body is, it's either gonna go to your hips, your thighs, your belly. It's gonna go to your, your, your bra fat area or under the arms, the saggy part of the arms. So your body will store it as fat and your body says, I'll get to that later. When she starts eating clean and stop putting more of this stuff in our bodies, start exercising, we'll start burning off that fat. We'll start burning off the fat. So think about that. Bad carbs, yes, we do not want to eat bad carbs. But if you look at your chart, there's a green section and that green section is where all the carbs are your essential plants, your plant, your, uh, your fruits, your vegetables, your beans and legumes, and your whole grains. Those are the carbs that, that we want to eat. These are the carbs that have vitamins, nutrients, minerals, all the things that our bodies eat. And then we, we're gonna look at protein. And we know that protein is necessary for muscle growth for tissue repair, and for keeping us feeling full longer. If you eat a salad every day, you can say, I'm gonna eat salads all day long, and that's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lose this weight, I'm gonna lose this weight. After a couple of salads, you're gonna be like, I need some meat, I need some meat. So I always tell people, you can have a salad every day, but add some protein to it. And it doesn't have to be meat. I have people who are vegans, but they know that they can add beans, they can add um, tofu. There's so many other options for protein, but you've got to get protein with every single meal, every meal, very important. And the reason why I say that is because the protein is what keeps us feeling full longer. So what the typical American thinks is there's breakfast, then a snack, then lunch, then a snack, then dinner, than a snack. So that's six meals. Most, most uh, dietitians and nutritionists will tell you to eat five or six small meals a day. I don't even say breakfast, lunch, and dinner we, because a lot of us do intermittent fasting, which means that we start our, our first meal at around 11 or 12. And that's our first meal. It doesn't have to be breakfast. In America, we've gotten used to the idea that breakfast is pancakes, waffles, eggs, bacon, sausage, those kinds of foods, pastries. Your first meal is the meal that breaks your fast. We know that when we're sleeping, we're fasting. We're giving our bodies a chance to repair. We're giving our bodies a chance to regenerate. We're giving our brains a chance to uh, file away the things that we learn, the memory process, all those things happens during our fast. And you are supposed to break your fast every day. You break your fast with food. So meal one, when I talk about meal plans, I say meal one, meal two, meal three, meal four, meal five, because with every meal, we're going to have some form of protein and some form of carbohydrates. So you might eat an apple as a snack, but we're going to also add some nuts for protein or a cup of beans and a banana or um, so a, a small salad with some uh, boiled eggs on top or something like that but it's always gonna be carbohydrates and at least protein. Fats, we all need fats too. Our brains are made up of 60% fat. So we've got to feed the brain as well. Bad fats, there are lots of, lots of bad fats, bacon fat, you know, and I appreciate that this is a, a church group because if you think about when you when I, don't, I know right now we're probably not meeting in person, but think about um, the times when you would go to church and you know there's going to be an Easter service and they're going to serve breakfast, or um, there's going to be a pastor anniversary and they're going to serve dinner afterwards or something like that. Think about the foods that they provide, 
Or think about a funeral, after the funeral, the repast, what kind of food is there? It's usually the same kind of foods. I always say, when you go to a funeral, they feed you afterwards, they feed you the same foods that kill the person whose funeral that it was. Fried chicken, green beans with bacon or ham hocks or fat in them, a, a whole table full of desserts, because everybody has to bring in their favorite dessert. I make the best chocolate cake. I make the best apple pie. I make the best. You've got all that food laid out. All of those foods, if they're not cooked correctly. Now you can have all those foods, but you've got to cook them correctly. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to clean up our diets, make them clean eating. Okay. But we need proteins, we need carbs, we need fats. It's just the type that we need. So I'm going to stop here and share another video. Before I do that, are there any questions? No, I know it's a lot of information. Um, right. can I, so on the, on the chart, on the yes. chart that we have, yes. and you have the green, the orange, and the and the red. Yeah. So, uh, so is all that included in the in, or in the meal plan? Yes. So let me. Um, I'm sharing this just so that everybody else can see the chart. I I know he right. is driving. Right. Ooh, did you say something uh, else? I'm not driving. My husband's driving. Oh, I'm okay. Okay. I said, I'm not driving. My husband's driving. I'm just okay, good. <laughs> I, th I think you're in a bad area. We can, I can't hear you. She might be in the mountains, Rosa. Oh. So. <laughs> you're going to have to repeat that, Tony. We can't hear you. Or maybe it's just me. Can everybody else hear her? No, I, I think one of the questions might be, uh, Rosa, on this chart, are these, like, can we eat from all these columns? I think. Oh, oh no. I, so tough. I was saying at the bottom. Yes. At least helping. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay, well, go ahead, go ahead with the video. I'll ask it later. Okay. All right. It, this, the video is going to explain a lot of this. Okay, okay thank you. Now, in some circles, carbs have gotten a bad rap. So it might surprise you to hear that this program is actually a high carb diet. If you look, you'll notice in the essential plan category that these carbs fill up the majority of the list. That's because carbs are the single most important food you can eat for long-term weight loss and health. Now, if you feel confused about carbs, you're not alone. The quickly absorbed carbohydrates that form the bulk of the American and increasingly the world's diet are from sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and white flour. And these are very efficiently turned into, guess what? Belly fat in your body, which leads to obesity, diabetes, or what I call diabetes. Now, when I say this program is a high carb diet, I'm referring to these slowly absorbing carbs that are rich in fiber, rich in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. These are nature made, not factory made carbs. And these will keep you full and lean and healthy for very few calories. You want the right plants, the right carbs. Things like unrefined, unprocessed carbs, otherwise known as vegetables and fruits, surprise. Whole grains, not flowers, not whole grains made into flour like whole wheat flour, but whole grains, the actual whole grain, and beans, these are also carbs, 
but they're a little starchier. Now, when you consider dinner, choose two or three different kinds of veggies. When you eat out, order two or three sides of veggies and skip the bread, the potatoes, the rice, and the pasta, which are proven to pack on the pounds and cause diabetes. Now, as you'll notice, plant foods should make up about 50 to 75% of your diet. Now, that's a big change for most of us, but the closer you can come to downsizing the meat and starch and upsizing the veggies, the more you'll improve your health and the health of the planet. Now let's talk about protein and how to power up your body with protein. The secret to optimal health, to cutting cravings, to balancing your blood sugar and losing weight is getting high quality protein in every single meal. Protein is made up of amino acids. Those are the building blocks that help build so many things in your body, including muscles and hormones and enzymes and brain chemicals called neurotransmitters. They're also critical for building all the structure, things like healthy hair and nails and your skin. All these depend on adequate, optimal protein intake. Now, while your body can create some amino acids, others, called essential amino acids, only can come from food. In fact, the only things that your genes do is to assemble these amino acids into proteins that provide instructions for everything that happens in your body. And it controls whether you're overweight or fit, whether you're sick or healthy. Now, because your body cannot store protein, you must constantly get it from food. Now, the amount of protein your body requires depends on a lot of factors, including your age, your gender, the amount of physical activity you do, and other things. Now, you're gonna to wanna to include good quality protein with every meal and it should make up about 25% of your plate. The typical serving size is four to six ounces or about the size of your palm. Really easy to remember. So what are your best or ideal protein sources? Now Americans have come to equate protein with beef, pork, or chicken. And it's still the centerpiece of most dinner plates at home and in restaurants. And the whole debate over veganism or paleo diets really confuses people even more, right? How could they both be right? Well, there is science on both sides to back up the health claims. Some studies show that too much animal protein in dairy can cause heart disease and cancer. Now, the problem with many of these studies is the protein quality. If you compare spam or deli meats or even feedlot factory farm beef and chicken and pork to the wild and lean and omega-3 rich deer and elk or wild game or grass-fed meat or organically raised poultry, the effects on your body are quite different. Now, not all protein is created equally. Now let's talk about healing fats. Now, like carbs, dietary fat has received a universally bad reputation. And that's kind of unfortunate since the right fats are incredibly health promoting. About 60% of your brain is fat, mostly omega-3 fats. And the many roles that fat plays in your body includes healthy cell membrane production, the support of cognitive or brain function, it helps you absorb nutrients like vitamin D and vitamin K and vitamin E from your gut. Even your sex hormones are made out of fat, like testosterone and estrogen. Specifically, it's made out of cholesterol, believe it or not. The good fats, like the omega-3 fatty acids from fish, and other fat-containing foods like nuts and seeds and avocados and olive oils and olives and coconut butter, all these have been shown to reduce diabetes, to reduce heart attacks and cancer, and even dementia. They also lower the bad form of cholesterol, which are these small, dense LDL particles we'll talk about later, as well as lowering triglycerides, and they raise the good cholesterol, or HDL. And there are also powerful anti-inflammatory compounds in these fats, like omega-3 fats and the fats in coconut butter. But more importantly, they make your food taste good. They make it satisfying. This program includes a variety of healthy fats that you can mix in with your meals and you can stock your pantry with. So learn to use them. It can be as simple as grabbing a handful of nuts, opening a can of wild salmon, or taking a spoonful, mmm, yum, of creamy coconut butter from the jar, or maybe using a little extra virgin olive oil for your veggies or your salad. So don't be afraid of fat. 
There are lots of great fats. And, of course, there are bad fats. So focus on the good fats, which provide nourishment and flavor for all your meals. Next, I want to talk about vitamins and minerals, which together constitute what we call micronutrients, because they're needed in small amounts or micro amounts. Our current American diet is a problem for both what it contains, right? Too much sugar and processed fats and salt and additives and hormones and pesticides and genetically altered inflammatory proteins, and for what it does not contain, right? Omega-3 fats, fiber, magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, D vitamin, antioxidants, and lots more. Now, except for most omega-3 fats, vitamin B12 and vitamin D, all these come from plant-based diets. Plants contain nearly all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients and fiber in our diet. These are essential for keeping our biology in balance and, in particular, for regulating our weight and our metabolism. See, vitamins and minerals are the grease that lubricate the wheels of our metabolism. And they also help all the chemical reactions in our body run properly, including those involved in regulating your blood sugar and, by the way, in burning fat. Our current diet is energy dense, right? Too many calories, but nutrient poor, not enough vitamins and minerals. All these empty calories that we consume cause our metabolism to break down and disease and obesity to flourish. I'll discuss fiber later, but let's briefly look at why you should be taking each of these nutrients. First, B vitamins. They play lots of roles in the body, including running cellular metabolism. It's actually how you burn calories. It helps your nerve function and your brain cells work. It helps your food break down. It helps your hormones regulate and be produced properly. In fact, they're needed to burn calories and create energy. They also help boost happy mood chemicals in the brain, which makes you feel happier. I like that. Magnesium is the relaxation mineral, and it helps regulate your blood sugar. And guess what? It runs over 300 enzyme reactions in your body, all of which are important for your health. Unfortunately, the latest government study shows that 68% of Americans don't get the recommended daily intake of magnesium. Next, we'll talk about vitamin D. Vitamin D regulates over 200 functions in our body. It boosts your immune system, it helps prevent cancer, and it enhances muscle function, so it makes your muscles work better and be less painful. It helps your heart health, it helps your brain function, it helps your bones be strong and healthy, and it's important for mood, especially seasonal affective disorder, which happens when you live in the North. Vitamin D deficiency affects nearly 80% of Americans. And yet it's super easy to fix by taking enough vitamin D. Next, we're also deficient in omega-3 fats. These are powerful brain foods. They're also powerful anti-inflammatories and cool off inflammation in your body. They also are critical for mood and for your immune system. And guess what? They also reduce your risk of heart attacks and depression, even diabetes and dementia. Now, plant-based foods provide the vast majority of your vitamins and minerals. And that's one reason this program primarily focuses on essential plants. All right, um, Tony, you, you had a question you wanted to ask or? No, it's, it's answered, thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, good. So um, we're gonna talk now about the actual um, um, essential plants. But I wanted to take a second here. Um, of course, this program doesn't really go into detail about what the Bible says about food that we eat. But the Bible actually gave us our food plan, our first meal plan, right? And I know you're familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God told Adam and Eve, here I have given you all vegetation bearing seed, which is on the surface of the whole earth and every tree on which there is fruit of a tree bearing seed. To you, let it serve as food. 
In verse 30, he goes on to say, even the animals shall have green vegetation. So the herbs and the green vegetation, the, the, the leaves, um, plants, those were supposed to be for the animals and humans were supposed to eat fruit. Just fruit. So then that was prior to sin. That was before Adam and Eve sinned against God and ate from the tree. Um, God told them in Genesis chapter two, verse 16, from every tree of the garden, you may, you may eat to satisfaction. And in verse 17, but as for the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it for in the day you eat from it, you will positively die. So they had a whole garden. They, you know, they, they were, the garden of Eden was set in the east of the, of the earth. And they had access to every single type of fruit they could possibly eat. And now we don't know specifically what fruit that they did eat when they ate from the, the, the tree of life, but um, God told them, that's the only tree. That's the only tree that you shouldn't eat from. But other than that, you can eat from all of the fruit trees in this garden. So fruit was supposed to be our diet. And we know that fruit was the original fast food because guess what? We didn't have to cook it. We didn't have to do anything except grab it and bite it, maybe peel it and eat it, right? He told us that. That, that was straight from the Bible. So how did the diet change? How did you know things change? Well, we know that after sin was entered, after Adam and Eve sinned against God, he, he said he cursed the earth and he was gonna make it hard for them. And he said that um, in Genesis chapter three, verse 18, and the thorns and thistles with uh, which will grow for you and you must eat the vegetation of the field. Now, remember he said in the beginning, the animals would eat the vegetation, but now he's opening up the plants to Adam and Eve too. And he said, you're gonna have to grow it. You're gonna till this, you know, you get the sweat from your face is what's going to help you produce this this oil this uh this food. So now you've got to plant, you know, you got to till the earth, that you got to clear out the thorns and the thistles. Nowadays we have to clear out the weeds if we have a small garden, right? But um so he said that um until you you're going to eat like this until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust from dust to dust you will return. So that means that at first we had all the fruit trees and then God put them out of the garden of Eden and said, because he said, you know, he's talking to Jesus and he said, listen, if we, if we let them stay here, they're going to probably eat from that tree again. And we know that that tree was the tree of life, which meant that you, you lived for the rest of your life. You know, um, you, you wouldn't die. And he told them, if you sin against me, you're going to die. So they did eventually die. But they were now eating fruits and vegetables, right? So then remember too, sin was, it was um, the, the, the wages of sin were bestowed upon everything on the earth. The entire earth was, the grounds were cursed. So that meant the animals were also going to die. Now, we know that when an animal dies, their carcass rots, it decays, and then there is disease. And so what God did was he turned some of the animals into flesh-eating animals so that the weaker animals would be killed and used as food so that there wasn't all these dead animals all over the place that was just spreading disease. So he was still protecting humans. He was still protecting us, but um, he now made some of the animals predators. So that's where eating the meat started, but not for us, not, for, not yet for humans. So we still were vegetarians or vegan. So what happened? How did we start eating meat? Where did the meat come into play? Because we know that God said that everything under the sun is fit for consumption, but when did the meat start? Well, 
we go into um, Genesis. Uh, so then, you know, there was so much, um, so much evil on earth. We know that God destroyed the earth with a flood, right? So Noah and his family got put on the ark and the animals two by two were put on the ark and they survived. Well, once they finally, when the, when the, um, the, the dove found the olive tree, that told Noah that, okay, there's we're, we're, the flooding is over. Now the trees are coming back. But when, when God landed the ark and let them come off of the ark after the water had subsided, all the plants had been destroyed. There was no food plant on the, on the earth. So God told them, if you've got your Bible or you're taking notes, Genesis 9, 3, and 4. That's when God told Noah that him and his family could start eating the animals as their food. As long as they didn't eat the flesh, the animal flesh, which contained the blood. So Genesis 9, chapter 3, ch chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, he said, everything or every moving animal that is alive may serve as food for you. As in the case of green vegetation, I do give it all to you. Only flesh with its soul, when, and we know that in the Bible, soul is talking is referring to the blood of the animals, you must not eat. So we know now when animals are butchered, what is the first thing they do? The farmers or whoever's uh, growing the, or raising them will take the animal, slit the throat, hang them upside down so that the blood comes out, right? Because we're not allowed to eat the animal blood. Although there are some cultures who do eat pig blood, they eat, you know, I, I know the Philippines, they have blood sausages and they eat it, but we're not supposed to eat animals blood and, we, and the Bible tells us that. But after the flood, God told them, you, can, you gotta eat the animals now because there was no vegetation that had grown back yet. So you gotta survive off of something. So eat the vegetation. He knew it was gonna take a while for the plants to grow back. So he didn't intend for this to be a long-term thing. Because remember in Genesis, he said, you're gonna do, you're gonna eat the vegetation of the ground until you return dust to dust, right? So then there's another example of when, you know, the, the, um, the people started eating flesh. So we know that when God led Israel out of Egypt, he fed them manna, right? Manna from heaven. He, the Israelites ate manna for 40 years. And most people don't you know, realize, but it was 40 years. Every single day, they ate the same thing. And I, I always love this example because I tell people when they, when they tell me, oh, you know, I got this meal plan. You gave me the meal plan, but I, I don't like eating the same stuff, uh, you know, over and over and over and over and over. And I'm like, do you realize the Israelites had to eat manna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day for 40 years? For 40 years. So when he, he led them out of, out of Egypt and, you know, they ate the manna. And then we know that in Numbers chapter 11, the whole chapter is about how the Israelites told Moses they were ready to eat meat again. Like we, we were doing much better when we were in Egypt. We, we could eat meat. And now we've been living off of this manna for 40 years. We want meat. When can we eat meat again? When is God going to let us eat meat? And so Moses went up in the mountain. He had to talk with God. And he says, I've got these 600,000 people and they all on my back about meat and they want to eat meat. I know you gave us all manna and the manna is good, but what am I supposed to tell them? What am I supposed to do? And God gave him instruction on how to go get the, the 70, you know, the, the elders, I guess you would call them. And so he said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to let you eat meat again. You know, it's kind of like a, a kid when the kid keeps asking mama, can I have some candy? Can I have some candy, please? Can I have some candy? And you just get broken down. You, you get mad and you're like, fine, fine. Eat the candy, eat the candy. Well, let me tell you. Um, they, he, he, let them, he let them have it. He was like, okay, fine. In anger, he told them, 
yes, you can eat meat now. You can eat the animals, but he even told them exactly what animals that they had to eat. You know, they couldn't eat um, um, the, the hoof, the split hoof animals. They couldn't eat camels, for example. So, you know, he told them exactly what they could eat. But keep in mind, you know, everybody tells me, oh, but, you know, God says we can eat meat. He gave us permission. Yes, he gave us permission. But we know that it was not the desire for him. He didn't desire us to eat animals. It was just out of anger that he said, fine. I want you to eat until the, he said, eat it until the, the, it, the, it, it's coming out of your nostrils. You choke on this meat. Go ahead, eat, 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 eat. So we know that's not what he really, really wanted for us. Now, does that mean that we should we should eat a plant-based diet? Should we eat um, just uh, vegetables or, or is it okay to eat, eat meat? That's up to you, it's a personal preference. But Daniel even told us, we know in Daniel that when the, um, when the Hebrew boys were to, you know, Pharaoh took them and he was like, listen, I'm going to feed you all the, this food that I feed my, my court. And they said, no, 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 we don't eat like that. We only, if you can just give us our fruit and vegetables, that's all we want to eat. And he was like, what? I can't afford to give you fruit and vegetable. I need you to be strong. I need you to be. And they said, just give us some time on this diet. This is the diet that we eat. Just give us some time. And it turned out that they were even stronger and more healthy than Pharaoh's army men who ate, you know, steak and, and meat and all this help, this fatty food. So all throughout the Bible, there are so many uh, examples of how, and God talks about uh, food a lot in the Bible, but he teaches us about what we should eat, not necessarily what we shouldn't eat. Um, we know that, um, um, Jesus ate locusts. And most people think, when they think locusts, they think about the, the grasshopper-like thing, but locust is, is a plant. And the Bible confirms throughout that that's what he ate. It was a plant-based um, diet that he had. So, you know, you have to figure it out. Plants are, you know, in this particular program, 75% of it is based on plants, it's based on vegetation, but there are allowances for meat too. So if you're a meat eater, the thing that we want you to eat is going to be high quality meat. So you've got to get, you know, grass fed steak if you're gonna eat red meat, it's gotta be grass fed. It can't be, um, and I always tell people if, you know, because they'll say, can I eat ground turkey? Yes, you can eat ground turkey, but there's 85%, you know, fat-free ground turkey versus 93% fat-free, uh, you know, fat, um, low-fat uh, ground turkey. Which is better for you? Obviously, you want the leaner one that doesn't have all the fat in it. So it's about making choices. We already know what the Bible says about it. So once you know better, I always tell people, once you know better, you got to do better, right? But it's a personal choice. You decide. Now, we're going to go to uh, uh, questions, comments, concerns, anything before we move on. I know we got a lot of information and, and not so much time. So we're going to go ahead to the next I have one. a question. I yes. have one. They yes. mentioned the different types of vitamins. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about supplements or are you saying that those type of vitamins you can receive through the foods that you eat? Specifically through the food. Um, you should really only use supplements if you have a deficiency in a specific area. For example, about 80% of Americans have a vitamin D deficiency and therefore their doctors will prescribe vitamin D supplements. Those vitamin D supplements are effective, they work. However, we also know that our bodies can create vitamin D just by you walking outside and standing in the sun for about 15 minutes every day. It's natural, it's, it, your, your body takes the natural sun rays, the ultraviolet sun rays and converts it to vitamin D. 
It's just that most of us sit inside, you know, a lot of us are working from home now. We don't ever go outside. <laughs> we have food delivered to us. We don't have to go to the grocery store. So it's about changing the lifestyle. Just go outside, maybe sit down, have a cup of coffee while you're outside or drink a cup of tea while you're outside. Diane. Unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Um, I noticed a lot of people talk about fish oil, fish mm -hmm. oil pills. What what what's your um what's your idea on fish oil, oil mm -hmm. supplements? So um fish oil supplements are good because they have omega-3 fatty acids, and that's very powerful for your brain. But mm -hmm. the reason why most people take the fish oil supplements is for their joints. Okay, so your knees, and it is good. Athletes take about 5,000 milligrams of omega-3 um, fish oil supplements every day. And it, because it's also good for muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. And we know that these ball players, football players, basketball players, baseball players, whatever they, their sport is, they, don't, they can't afford to be sore. You know that if you work out one day, the next day you can barely move because you're so mm -hmm. sore. Fish oil supplements will help that. So I always tell people at the gym, Get your fish oil supplements. You don't need as many as athletes, but I do recommend about 3,000 3, milligrams 000. a day. So one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. So with your meals, you have that. Okay, thank you. Now, if you eat a lot of salmon, for example, or I a lot salmon. of mackerel, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so those fish are high in omega-3 fatty, uh, fatty uh, acid anyway. So you're going to get it from that. But um, on a daily basis, if you just want to be consistent, then yes. Okay. Usually I try to eat salmon either once or twice a week. So I still should, is it still okay for me to take those 3,000? I would take them, yes. I would. Okay. I mean, if you, if you move a lot, if you're, if you're very active, you definitely need that. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you don't need 300. Maybe if you're not exercising on a daily basis, you probably would just need about 2,000 milligrams a day. So one in the morning, one in the evening. Okay. And a lot of people don't like to take them because of the smell. You know, it comes yeah. out, <laughs> you yeah. burp it up all yeah. day or some mm -hmm. people have it coming out of their pores. You can smell it. But um, they have the odorless kind now too. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions before we move on? I, I had a question about um, red foods. I didn't quite uh, get everything you said about red foods. Red meat? Avoid red Oh, was it red meat? Avoid. I thought I heard uh, him say something about avoiding red food. Okay, so the <laughs> two things like that it. he talked about, um, the red vegetables that have lycopene, which is a, an antioxidant that we absolutely need. So beets, um, tomatoes, the different red, you know, different red uh, vegetables, great for you. On the other hand, red meats, not so much. And that's because we today don't get high quality red meats. I'm gonna close my door for a second. I husband just got home. Um, but yeah, red meats, the quality of the red meats and deli meats that are in the typical grocery store are very poor quality. These are um, usually cows that are raised on a farm and they're fed corn or um, they don't eat their grass, the natural grass that they're supposed to eat. They just feed them anything to try to fatten them up. They plump them up with hormones. So about five years ago, the Surgeon General of the United States declared that red meats can be carcinogenic. That means it causes cancer. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know about the red meat, but I was wondering about yeah. the other red food. No, red foods, red vegetables the brighter the colors, the better. That's the thing that you always want to remember. The brighter the vegetables, carrots, tomatoes, butternut squash, pumpkin, mm -hmm. those bright orange, yellow, purple colors, eggplant, those things are great for you. You're going to get the vitamins and minerals that you need from that. Yeah. So he was saying load up on those. Okay. And the thing to remember with the, the uh, vegetables, especially the um, like the squashes and things like that, Remember, the best time to eat any food is when it's in season. So we know that in the fall, that's when all the squashes grow, the pumpkins grow. Um, you know, there's like uh, 
20 different types of squash, acorn squash, butternut squash, spaghetti squash. Those things, are you're supposed to eat them when they're in season because that's when you get the most nutrients from them. We know that in the summer or in the spring, strawberries are usually in season. Try to get as many strawberries as, as you can. Um, you can freeze them. They are good for the red, the, that red strawberry, those antioxidants that are in them. Absolutely great for you. So if you can try to remember when things are in season, that's when we're supposed to eat them. When they're not in season, that means they're being shipped from somewhere where they are in season. And a lot of times you might get, you might get bananas and it might say from Argentina, or you might get um, peaches that are grown in California. We know that when those particular um, fruits and vegetables are available in the East Coast in the off season, it usually takes about seven days just for them to truck across the, the country. So you're not getting as fresh as you need. I even tell people, if you're gonna eat fruit throughout the year, eat frozen fruit, put your frozen fruit in your smoothies because frozen fruit is flash frozen right out in the fields. They've got processes now where they're picked, they're washed, they're put in baggies or put in containers and they are stuck in these freezers out on the fields, flash frozen to zero degrees right away. And then a truck comes, picks up those freezers and then takes them to the supermarkets. So that's, that's frozen freshness right there. It's, the freshness is frozen in there. So fro frozen fruits and vegetables are even better than fresh unless you're getting your fruits and vegetables from a local farmer's market because usually the local farmer's market, that means they're picking them that day or that morning or the day before and taking them to the market. So you're pretty much getting as fresh as you could possibly get. Things in the grocery store, not necessarily fresh unless it says, um, you know, sourced locally. I know in Giant, they have a sign that says source some of the, uh, some of, just some of the items are sourced locally. That means that they've got a farmer or a few farmers here in the area and they're getting their fresh produce, their green beans and things like that. So those, you know, I, I, I don't mind um, getting. We have a farmer's market here in, in Stafford. It's opening back up this coming Sunday tomorrow from eight to one. And I go there um, and if you, and a tip, just a, a quick tip <laughs> is if you go like at 12 or 12.30 before they're gonna close at one, you can get so many deals because they wanna try to get rid of as much as possible because remember, it has to be fresh the next week. They can't hold it and then bring it out the next week. So go, I went there one time and I was like, I just want you know two little baskets of tomatoes. And he was like, you know what? You can just take the whole case, the whole carton. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I came home and I made spaghetti sauce, homemade spaghetti sauce. <laughs> um, but so yes, go to the farmer's market. That will give you the best, the freshest. Take that list of, um, and I, this is the homework that I always give people. You've got your chart. Go through that chart and circle all the vegetables, all the fruits that you know that you like. And then challenge yourself to try something that you probably haven't had before. I, I, I tried um, papaya for the first time maybe four or five years ago. And now papaya is my most favorite fruit in the whole world. And before I just, I didn't like the way it looked. I cut it open and it had these little black seeds in there. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? I can't eat this. And, you know, it has kind of a perfumey kind of taste if you've never had it. Um, kind, not as strong as like, um, um, it's kind of a, 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 a muted flavor, kind of like honeydew cantaloupe. You know how the, those aren't really strong. So papaya is the same way. Papaya inside, pinkish red, so bright colors. You take the seeds out, don't eat the seeds, but it has a natural digestive enzyme. So if you have a problem with irritable bowel syndrome, you suffer from constipation, eat papaya and it will flush your system out. So you're getting the antioxidants, you're getting the fiber, you're flushing your system. So if you take a look at that chart, you'll notice that in the green section, you've got the, um, they call these low glycemic fruit. That means that 
they don't spike your blood sugar. So especially if you're diabetic, these are the kinds of fruits that you wanna eat on a regular basis. The things that are in the orange section, the fruits that are in the orange section, these are gonna spike your blood sugar a little bit. Remember though, fruit provides natural sugar. So it's okay, but just remember you can't eat them every day. You can't have pineapple every day. You can't have grapes every day. The orange section means occasionally. And in my mind, occasionally means maybe once a week or once every two weeks. And then the red section, you see the juices, the fruit juices. What, why, why are fruit juice there? Fruit juice is there because on a typical basis, when you are, when you are eating an apple, you're eating the juice from the apple, right? And you're eating the fiber from the apple. If you're eating the skin, that's where all the fiber is. That's where the vitamins are because the skin is usually green or red or you know, depending on the color of the apple, yellow. That's where the vitamins and nutrients, they're in the, in the flesh, in the, the outside. The flesh of the apple is made of fiber and then there's juice. So when you chew in it, you're, you're chewing the juice. If you ever made homemade orange juice before that you're gonna serve for breakfast, you're gonna make, I'm, I'm making a full breakfast for my family. I'm gonna squeeze some oranges. How many oranges does it take just to make an eight ounce glass of orange juice? Probably about three or four. So as you, as you think about it, would you ever in one sitting eat three or four oranges? No, because God didn't make our fruit to be like that. Basically, one orange would give us the serving size of what we need for that moment. That is enough to give us the vitamins, the minerals, and the juice or the water that we need. We don't need three or four in one sitting. And that is why we shouldn't drink orange juice. The only time we should really drink orange juice is if you're diabetic and you're, you're suffering from a, an incident and you just need to quickly spike your blood sugar, take a sip of orange juice. But otherwise, you shouldn't. Yes, Diane. Last question. Um, my husband just asked me to go out and buy him some VA juice. Okay. Now, I need to, because we, we need to stop this if, if he shouldn't be drinking it. So what's your opinion on that? Okay, so V8 juice is great. If you read the instruction or read the ingredients and you make your own V8 juice. However, the V8 juice in the container, look at how much sodium is in that. It's so salty. There's actually, um, uh, Gosh, what's her name? There's a YouTube lady. Her name is um, Fully Raw Christina. And she has a recipe for real V8 juice. And it's just basically tomatoes and celery and peppers and whatever the ingredients are that are on the bottle when you buy the V8 juice. You can make your own except take out the sodium. The sodium is just there for preservative. So... And that's why, you know, I tell people, if you're going to eat fruit, vegetable, start with fresh first. If you can get real, true, fresh, you know, two or three days old from the farm, that's fresh. Or frozen, because we know frozen is flash frozen. It's fresh. Canned or bottled fruit and vegetables should be our last resort, because the only way they can last on the shelf is if they add sodium or some other type of preservative. When you get your canned green beans, what do you have to do? You have to rinse them, right? You got to rinse that sodium off. You have to pour off that sodium water that they've been soaking in and you've got to rinse them. So fresh, if possible, if not, then frozen. And then as a last resort, like you, listen, I can't afford fresh or frozen, but I can afford these cans because Giant has them on sale for 45 cent a can. So at least I'm getting vegetables in my family at a, at a, at a price that I can afford. That should, should be your last resort. That should be when you're getting anything out of a can or a bottle. Okay. All right. We're gonna move on to our next video. And this video, speaking of labels, 
is about our, I, or did I skip one? Yeah, so we're going to talk about, um, I think I'm missing a video. Let's see. The last one was macronutrients. Yep, so now we're going to talk about. Um, Didn't we do essential plants? Yes, we did that, right? Yeah. Yes, because we just talked about the plants. Okay, all of the, yeah. yes. So now we're going to talk about the essential calories. Now, this one is long. I'm not sure if we're going to have time to listen to the whole thing. Um, it's about 17 minutes long. You know what, Rosa? What? Okay, you didn't start it already. I you was going to say, since we had tw about 25 minutes left, I know they wanted to talk about the sugar detox. Yes. Was there anything in particular anybody wanted to discuss? Or we'll just watch the video. We'll just watch a little bit of it. We'll just okay. watch a little bit of it. Okay. All right. Now that we've concluded with the essential plant category, we want to look at the essential calories category. Now in the green group of these essential calories, you'll find healthy fats, good quality animal protein, and other things. So let's start with the healthy fats. Now nuts are a wonderful source of protein. They're full of fiber and minerals. They have great fats that satisfy your appetite and Guess what? They reduce the risk of diabetes and heart disease. So nut butters are a great snack. Now, not peanut butter, which is more inflammatory and also contains a naturally occurring fungus toxin called aflatoxin. Now, here are some of the things to keep in mind when it comes to nuts and seeds. First, keep bulk nuts tightly isolated and sealed in the pantry or in the fridge because they can go rancid. Eat walnuts, almonds, pecans, and macadamia nuts. Peanuts are beans, actually. They're not really nuts. They also contain more of these inflammatory omega-6 fats, which we're going to talk about later, so keep them to a minimum. Also, I want you to watch portion sizes, because you can go nuts on nuts, right? A serving of nuts is basically a handful, about 10 to 12 nuts. You don't want to eat a whole bag of almonds. Buy raw or lightly toasted, unsalted nuts. Avoid the nuts that are fried or cooked in oils and heavily salted. Seeds are also easy to add to salads, to bean or grain dishes, or to put in shakes, or just enjoy a handful. The typical seeds that are great are zinc-rich pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and sesame seeds. I also encourage you to use hemp seeds and chia seeds, which are a great source of omega-3 fats. They're full of minerals and fiber and a powerful superfood. Let's start with coconut oil. It's an excellent example of a healthy saturated fat. In fact, it's about 92% saturated fat but it raises the good cholesterol, or HDL, and it increases the light, fluffy LDL cholesterol particles. It also contains a super fat, a special type of oil called MCT, or medium chain triglycerides. And this is a powerful, performance-enhancing fat that powers up your muscles and your workouts, and it powers up your brain cells. It also enhances sports performance because your cells run better on this special type of super fuel. You see, coconut oil is an extraordinary superfood that contains a special kind of anti-inflammatory saturated fat called lauric acid, which is actually found in breast milk. As I will explain below, saturated fat is not all the same. Feedlot beef is bad, while grass-fed beef is not. Organic or wild animals have healthy fats, while industrial corn-fed animals do not. Now, next let's look at polyunsaturated fats. That's the chemical name for it, but let's talk about what it actually is. They fall under two categories, omega-3 fats, which is like fish oil, you've heard of that, and omega-6 fats, which are from mostly from vegetable oils and are pretty inflammatory. First, let's consider the oils in the orange category. In small doses, certain types of unrefined omega-6 polyunsaturated fats are necessary. These are natural vegetable oils that have not been chemically processed. 
The problem in today's world is that the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fats in our diet has changed dramatically. We've been flooded with polyunsaturated vegetable oils of really poor quality. These refined oils include most commercially available cooking oils, things you'll see on the grocery store shelf. Things like corn oil, quote, vegetable oil, who knows what that is, I don't, safflower oil, canola oil, and all these other oils. You wanna check your own kitchen cabinet and see if you have a bottle of this stuff in there. It's probably there. It's almost everywhere these days, and the amount in which it's used is really unhealthy. But you can eat some of these oils, and let me tell you how. If you use expeller or cold-pressed versions of these oils in small amounts, it's okay, and it's actually necessary because we evolved with a balance of omega-3 and omega-6s. Now let me share with you a few examples of these fats that you can use in small doses and still maintain optimal weight loss and health. And these are the expeller or unrefined processed oils. These include grapeseed oil, high oleic sunflower and high oleic safflower oils, walnut oil, and sesame oil. These fats are unstable though, so you have to be careful. And they easily go rancid and they can be damaged when heating. So keep in the fridge and don't cook over high heat and make sure your oils don't smoke when you cook them because that turns them into oxidized dangerous fats. Now the one oil category I absolutely want you to stay away from is refined polyunsaturated vegetable oil. These include most commercially available vegetable oils including corn and soy, canola and safflower oil. In fact, soybean oil comprises 10% of our calories in our diet and it's pretty toxic. Most of these fats are extracted at high heats which damages their fragile fatty acids. They're also hydrogenated, resulting in a longer shelf life at the expense of your health. So when thinking about omega-6 fats, here's my advice. I would avoid eating processed oils for the most part, except in stir fries or a little bit in cooking, because humans, except for extra virgin olive oil, have never eaten these refined oils until the last 100 years. And it's created an imbalance between the omega-6 and the omega-3 fats. Next, let me explain the omega-3 fats, and I want you to pay attention because this is really important. There are two kinds of omega-3 fats. The type from plants called alpha-linoleic acid, or ALA, and that's found in flax seeds and chia seeds and hemp seeds and walnuts. And this is really good, but this actually has to be converted by the body into the type of fat that your body needs most called EPA and DHA also known as eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, or docosahexaenoic acid, D DHA. You don't have to remember that, just DHA and EPA. Only about 10% of the ALA gets converted into EPA and DHA, which is actually what your body really needs the most. So these preformed EPA and DHA are found only in wild fatty fish like sardines and wild salmon, and in wild and grass-fed meat. These fats are critical for the function of every cell in the body, and they make up the cell membranes of every one of your 10 trillion cells, and they make up about 60% of your brain tissue. They're powerful, they're anti-inflammatories, they're mood boosters, they're brain healers, they're heart protectors, okay? They lower your triglycerides and they reverse diabetes. So you really need these, and you need to make sure you get them in your diet, and perhaps even as supplements. Next, we need to review the other good fat, monounsaturated fat found mostly in extra virgin olive oil, but also in almonds and avocados and some nuts. Olives and olive oil are rich in monounsaturated fats and full of antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, polyphenol nutrients. Extra virgin olive oil is the main oil that you should use in your diet. Now you can put it in salads or you can pour it over veggies. You can even cook with it, but only on low temperatures. For high temperature cooking, I suggest you use grapeseed oil or even coconut oil. Next, let's talk about animal proteins. So whenever possible, you wanna choose animal products that have the most to contribute to your health and the least impact on the planet. So here are some of the best sources of animal protein. You can't always find the cleanest or the lowest impact or the most humanely raised animal sources. But following these guidelines, more than less, will shift our food production system, they'll improve your health, 
and they'll reduce the negative impact on the environment. So you get a triple benefit. Fish is one of the best sources of protein, but because of the contamination of our oceans and factory farm fisheries, finding safe fish is not as easy as it used to be. Today, it is the only wild food we eat, and it's also a rich source of omega-3 fats. So in order to eat fish that doesn't contain toxins and that is sustainably farmed or harvested, it requires a bit of homework. The best fish to eat are wild salmon and smaller toxin-free omega-3 rich fish, including sardines, herring, and mackerel. But here's a few warnings when buying fish. Quality matters here. Only buy wild-caught seafood and avoid farm-raised fish, which have many of the same problems as conventionally raised cows and other animals fed grain and corn and other foods that are not their natural diet. Now, there are some that are organic and sustainably raised fish. So I want you to check out cleanfish.com for a guide on what are the safe fish to eat. Okay, now back to fish. Pregnant women should avoid raw fish and they should avoid high mercury fish like tuna and swordfish, as well as Chilean sea bass and shark. So think small fish. If the whole fish can fit in your pan, the whole fish head to tail, it's probably safe to eat. Stay away, even if it's a big pan, okay? Stay away from the high mercury fish, including tuna and swordfish and the Chilean sea bass. Also, shrimp and scallops are healthy forms of seafood that are low in toxins and high in good quality protein and minerals. In fact, oysters are among the highest sources of zinc. Now, a tough one, eggs. We all are afraid of eggs. We're all eating egg-like omelets forever, but omega-3 eggs and free-range eggs are an excellent source of animal protein. In fact, eggs can actually lower your cholesterol and have not been linked to heart attacks in studies. They also contain choline and B vitamins. Now, choline helps in nerve signaling. It also helps maintain cell membranes, and it's a key part of your brain cells. It's also needed to produce acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter or brain chemical that's vital to nerve and muscle function. And it's a component of lecithin, which is critical to normal liver metabolism and detoxification. Next, let's cover poultry. Poultry is an excellent source of protein, along with nutrients like B vitamins, potassium, and selenium. Don't be afraid of fat here. It's mostly heart-healthy, monounsaturated fat. Chicken and turkey are good, inexpensive source of protein. And believe it or not, a roast chicken dinner that you make yourself is cheaper than a trip to McDonald's for a family of four and will result in better health for the whole family. When you can, buy higher quality organic or free-range antibiotic and hormone-free poultry. It's often available now, even at mainstream grocers. Now let's talk about other essential foods. Let's talk about coffee and dark chocolate, some of my favorite, and the other foods in the green category. These are dose-dependent foods. What that means is that a cup of coffee in the morning is okay, and it's a great way to start the day, but too much coffee can raise your blood pressure, raise your heart rate, make you anxious, cause bone loss, and lead to greater fatigue and insomnia. Also, dark chocolate contains phytonutrients called polyphenols. These are natural antioxidants and anti-inflammatory molecules that cool off inflammation and can help protect you against obesity. That's right, I said it. Dark chocolate can be a weight loss food, but only in moderation and only when you buy the right kind. So look for dark chocolate with at least 85% cacao, preferably organic, it's low in sugar. Sugar, even in dark chocolate, should be considered a recreational substance. If a little dark chocolate is good, it doesn't mean that a lot's better. Now let's talk about the essential calories and the orange category. And the orange category under essential calories, you'll see dairy products, red meat, alcohol, and certain animal fats, as well as other oils. So let's take a look at each of these. Dairies first. Americans have been taught that you need milk, that dairy is an essential human food, and that without it, our kids won't grow up to be big and strong, 
and that old lady's bones will dissolve in a heap from osteoporosis. We have been taught that milk is nature's perfect food, and it is but only if you're a calf, okay? Humans are the only species that drink milk after weaning, and the problems with dairy abound. First off, the dairy we eat today is not the dairy of yesteryear. The cows no longer are, quote, heirloom cows, and the casein protein in these genetically improved cow milk ca causes more allergies and more inflammation, leading to not only more congestion and asthma, and sinus problems, and kids' ear infections, and rashes, and eczema, but even more serious problems like autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes. And its big claim to fame, that it makes strong bones, turns out to be a big unproven myth. And new studies show that dairy may actually increase hip fractures and osteoporosis, or thinning bones. Now, a few dairy alternatives you might consider. You might want to try sheep or goat milk or cheese, but you want to choose the organic varieties. And they can be better tolerated, but they're still a hormonal food, so eat them in moderation. Make sure you choose products that are organic and that are from pasture-raised animals. And watch out for those flavored yogurts. They're often way higher in sugar than even a can of soda. Next, we'll tackle red meat. Let's consider red meat. As you can see, we want to downsize our meat consumption but you can still enjoy high quality red meat, but you have to eat less of it. Choose quality over quantity. Small amounts of lean organic grass-fed and hormone or antibiotic-free lamb or beef can be a part of a healthy diet. You can even think about buying and freezing a whole animal with your extended family and your friends. Now on a scale of best to worst, pork is probably the least healthy meat, you want to try leaner, more sustainably raised animal products, such as bison or buffalo, venison or ostrich, when you do decide to indulge in red meat because they are almost never industrially produced and almost always grass-fed and healthier. Regardless, you should be eating red meat no more than once or twice a week and no more than four to six ounces per serving. That's basically the size of your palm. Excess meat consumption has been associated with cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, so you want to be careful. Okay, what about alcohol? Next on the list is alcohol. Now like coffee, alcohol is a dose-dependent drink. Small amounts of wine or spirits can be part of a healthy lifestyle, but should not be more than three drinks a week for most people. If you have a high risk of breast cancer or are prone to mental illness or have liver or digestive problems or have a personal or family history of alcoholism or allergic to sulfites in wine, then you probably shouldn't drink. Now here's what I want you to remember. With red meat, dairy, alcohol, and certain oils, quantity and quality matter. All right. Okay, so lots of information there. Um, I just want to point out the dairy, the issue with dairy. Keep in mind that a dairy is meant or cow's milk is only meant for a cow, a baby calf. And it's because it has so many hormones that it's designed to turn this baby calf into a two ton animal within about two months. So when we drink cow's milk, we're putting those hormones into our bodies. Um, over the recent years, a lot of young girls have um, started their periods at like age nine and 10 instead of 13, 12, 13 years old. And they are contributing that to the milk, the hormones that are in the milk. And the milk is hydro hydrogenized, which basically mean, or um, homogenized. What that means is the milk comes from so many different cows, and then it is put together in this big vat. So it's, it's all mixed together. So you've got different hormones from different cows, cows, milk, there's some, a lot of graphic videos that will probably, if you ever drink milk, you'll probably never drink it again if you see it. But they show how they've got these machines milking these cows' udders. And these machines, these, the udders are so damaged. They are raw. They have infections. There's pus all around the, the cow's udders. The pus goes into the milk. They don't, they don't care. 
it gets into the milk. So not only are you now getting these hormones, but you're also getting disease that causes inflammation throughout your body. Cow's milk is not meant for us. Can you imagine yourself laying on the ground with the cow's udder in your mouth, drinking the milk, sucking the milk? No, you can't even imagine yourself doing that. So you've got to replace, I mean, I, the first thing I always recommend to everybody is give up dairy. It only causes inflammation. Inflammation is the root of all disease. So inflammation causes all of the itises. If you think about it, pancreatitis, lymph, uh, uh, you know, if you get your, your, your if your um, lungs become inflamed, you've got um, uh, pneumonia, you've got, um, heart, so you're, 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 you can develop pleurisy around your heart. All of this comes from inflammation. Inflammation in your brain, dementia, Parkinson's, that's, it's caused by inflammation. So you've got to realize that cow's milk is like the, the number one culprit of all of those, those illnesses. Arthritis is caused by inflammation in your joints. Each person is affected differently. So you, you know, yours might affect your joints, but somebody else might get um, hepatitis, liver disease pancreatitis, all of these different itises, it's caused by inflammation. And most times it's caused by drinking milk or eating cheese, dairy product. Very, very important. The other thing, I don't know, um, I'm getting my computer before it dies. The um, other thing I want to talk about is um, alcohol. You know, people tell, ask me all the time, can I drink alcohol. Can I have a glass of wine here and there? Yes, you can. But keep in mind that if you drink a glass of wine or any alcoholic beverages, if you drink a beer, if you drink a, a, a mixed drink, follow it with a glass of water. For every beer you drink, you drink an equal amount of water. For every glass of wine, you need an equal amount of water because your body looks at alcohol as poison. Your body is designed, it doesn't know that, oh, this is a good kind of poison that makes you feel relaxed or it makes you feel good. No, the body recognizes alcohol as poison. And everything that the body is designed to do, all cellular activity ceases. There's no fat burning. There's no metabolism boosting. There's no um, uh, 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 deep sleep. Nothing happens until the body rids itself of that alcohol. So your liver is going to work overtime to get rid of the alcohol. People say, you know, I only drink a glass of wine a night, so I don't know why I can't lose weight. I eat clean. Everything else is clean. I don't eat any processed foods. I don't eat any sugar. I eat clean, but I have a glass of wine. Well, guess what? Your body says, She's eating clean, she's working out, but I gotta burn off this fat, this uh, alcohol, this poison before I can do anything else. I can't burn off the fat. I gotta focus on the alcohol, gotta focus on the poison. So that's the note I wanted to make about that. Um, when it comes to dairy, some people say they can't give up milk, can't give up milk, then they recommend that you go with a smaller type animal. So that's why they recommend goat's cheese or goat's milk or, um, sheep cheese or sheep milk, you know, the milk that's from those smaller animals, because yes, you're going to be getting hormones, but the hormones aren't designed to make a big animal in a short period of time. But again, any kind of animal milk is meant for that particular animal. We as humans, we are supposed to breastfeed our, our babies. And once our babies get weaned off of the, the milk, they're not supposed to drink milk again. Well, what about my cereal? How can I eat my cereal without milk? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be eating cereal because it's just processed food. Number two, if you're gonna eat cereal anyway, then use a plant-based milk like almond milk or coconut milk, okay? But don't eat, uh, that's my number one thing is no dairy. <laughs> no dairy. If you're really trying to get your body in the best shape that you possibly can. 
then you do want to give up the dairy. Now, we're going to go to, I'm going to talk about food labels. Um, let me see here. I think we're going to talk about food labels. Yeah. So we're going to talk about food labels. Um, I think the video for that is pretty short. So let me just double check. Now she's going to talk about a lot of information um, and go really quickly through it. Um, just take notes about things that you're just not familiar with. Um, but this is some really good information. So let me share. What labels can and cannot say is dictated by law. Here's what they can say and what they mean. For daily values, the 5% or less and 20% or more can be used as a guideline for a poor and a good source of the nutrient respectively. So if it's 2% of vitamin C, it's not a great source. If it's 40% of vitamin B12, it's a great source. So let's break down the Nutrition Facts panel into small bites. First, all the ingredients are listed by weight, greatest amount first. So if sugar is first on the label, the product is mostly sugar. Number two, the serving size. How big is the portion? The USDA and FDA portion sizes don't match. Remember, our program's portion size is one cup for essential foods. Number three, how many servings are in the container? Even healthy foods are sometimes too high, too dense in calories for your program. Are there really three servings in that single organic nut fruit bar? Or two servings in that green ready to drink shake? But it looks so healthy. You have to multiply the calories by the serving size if you want to know how many calories are in the entire package of food. Even though you don't have to count, Make sure you have some sense of how many calories you're really eating. So let me walk you through a few tips for reading this part of the label, which will make healthy food choices easier. Start at the top. Serving size. This in theory reflects the amount that the average person eats at one helping. And then servings in that package. The next line tells you how many servings the package contains. Total fat. This line tells you how many grams of fat are in one serving. Five grams is about the equivalent of one teaspoon of fat. If a product is truly low fat, it will have three grams or less per serving. This one is not. It has 10 grams of total fat, about two and a half teaspoons of fat. If you are aiming to lose weight or improve cholesterol or diabetes, it pays to choose packaged items with no more than 5 grams of fat per serving. You'll notice that the label will highlight less healthy fats like saturated fats and trans fats. This bar has 1 gram of saturated fat, which is okay as long as it doesn't come from trans fats. Next, the label lists cholesterol. It says zero. Cholesterol is found essentially in only animal products. Cholesterol equals animal products. Okay, now look at sodium. It says five milligrams. In the course of a whole day, the daily values have a maximum of 2,400 milligrams. But if you're over 51 years young, have kidney or other health issues, or are African American, you should keep your intake below 1,500 milligrams. So that can be a guide as you read food labels. How about fiber? It says five grams. Look for minimally processed high fiber foods. According to the World Health Organization, otherwise known as WHO guidelines, aim for a minimum of 25 to 40 grams of fiber a day. Needless to say, you don't have to get it all from one food. When choosing bread and pastas, find the ones with the most fiber. A minimum of two grams 
per 100 calories is a good sign that it is a whole grain, but there's no guarantee. Always be sure to look for the words 100% whole grain first. Now what about sugar? The sugar line is tricky. Although health experts recommend that food companies add a line for added sugars, current labels do not distinguish between natural and healthful sugars found in foods and the not so healthful ones that are added. They are all combined into one number on the label called sugar. You might be surprised to find that sugar is added to a lot of packaged foods. Look for the ones that leave out added sugar. Let's check our bar label. It lists 18 grams of sugar in a serving. It takes about 4 grams of sugar to fill a teaspoon. So 18 grams is 4.5 teaspoons of sugar. Next comes protein. It has 4 grams of protein, not too much, about a half an ounce or a finger full of chicken or fish. No doubt you'll be getting enough protein from choosing a variety of choices in your diet, so no need to worry here. The daily values for the vitamins and minerals shows less than 10%, 4%, and even 0%. So maybe there is a more nutritious, lower fat and sugar bar that you could eat prior to or after a Zumba class that will energize you better. Nutrient and health claims? Food labels sometimes list other information, include nutrient and health claims. Here are some popular claims you will see. Low fat, heart healthy, reduced sodium, and a good source of whole grains. Each one has a very specific definition and cannot be used without meeting the guidelines of each one. So you have to carry a health claim Bible with you to keep track. Here are some of the most widely used guidelines and what they mean. So for low fat, it means three grams of fat or less per serving. Fat free, less than a half a gram of fat per serving, which means if you have several servings, it may no longer be fat free. Low sodium, less than 140 milligrams per serving. Low calorie, less than 40 calories per serving. Calorie free, less than 5 calories per serving. Low cholesterol, less than 20 milligrams of cholesterol and 2 grams of saturated fat. Suffice to say, here are the most important ones for you to remember that pertain to your four essential foods. Number one, certified organic or non-GMO on the product label. Don't let natural fool you. Natural means nada. There is no legal definition for natural. Go with 100% organic, which means just that. 100% of the ingredients other than water and salt are organic. Just organic means 95% of the product is organic. And includes organic means 70% of the ingredients have to qualify as organic. Certified organic also means it is non-GMO or not genetically modified. Non-GMO means that the product was made without the use of genetically modified ingredients. Since we don't know the long-term consequences of genetically modified foods, limit your daily intake as best as you can. In Europe, GMO foods are completely banned. Number two, sky is not the limit with fat. Fats, the amount, type, and source should always take priority in your food reading. Refer to your healthy fats lesson for more information on this. Number three, when it comes to heart health, zero trans fats in your diet is best. In 2007, the FDA allowed companies a no trans fat claim. That means about five grams of fat or less per serving. Number four, sodium can add extra pounds of water weight, but for others, it could cause high blood pressure. So who has to label? Most packaged foods and beverages, except food for immediate consumption, like at the supermarket buffet. Foods not for immediate consumption, but prepared on site, like behind the counter foods. Food shipped in bulk, like in the bins. Medical foods. 
plain coffee, tea, and some spices and other foods that contain no significant amounts of nutrients. So while you won't find labels on everything, staying on your program means playing it safe. All right. Any comments about that? Any questions? I'm pretty sure everybody's going, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I didn't realize about the grams of sugar, how much it equal to a teaspoon. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, about four grams is one teaspoon. So think about, if you look at um, soda, for example, a, a bottle, a can of soda, I don't have one here, but um, a can of soda usually has about, I don't know, 20 grams of sugar. 28 sometimes exactly so divide that number by four and that'll tell you how many teaspoons is is actually in that yeah <laughs> not not uh not fun at all nope yeah now i wanted to show you um real quickly another video is this the sugar detox that's coming up but um, just quickly, so this this um, lesson is called um, so it's food labeling and sh and grocery shopping. So when you're going into the grocery store, oh, how come uh, here? You know it rolls away. Wait a minute, Pam texts me. Pam, what time do you need to look? Uh, oh no, that's not what I was saying. I was just saying uh, whenever we finish. <laughs> oh okay, okay. I'm in no rush. No rush. Okay, I, may, I wanted to make sure you were okay. Oh, yeah, I'm does, good. Does anybody need to go right now? Because it's one. No? No. Okay. Only okay. person that left was uh, Elder Fobich, and she texted me, so. Okay. Not, right. not, not yet. I'm hanging in there for a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, oh, good. Okay. okay. I'll mm -hmm. make it brief. So when you go yeah, through your grocery your store, when you're in the grocery store, think perimeter. Think about the outside of the grocery store, the outside. There are only a few things that you'll need to go down the aisles to get. And that might be your beans or your whole grains like rice and quinoa or something like that. And maybe your um, grapeseed oil or avocado oil or extra virgin olive oils, things like that. Um, but otherwise you wanna shop the perimeter of your grocery store. You wanna stay with the, where the fruits and vegetables are everything on the outside. This is where, and you want to get your bright colored fruits and vegetables. Look at all those bright colors. Your reds, your blues, your blacks, your green, orange. Think perimeter of the grocery store. And this is actually our local giant here in Stafford. And this is just me. be some things that you might not have tried before. There's the papaya. I love papaya. <laughs> Mangoes. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. But you get the idea. Shop organic when you can, if you can afford it. A lot of times organic is, is more expensive.
right, that's it. Then we go check out. So we just go around the perimeter and then we check out from there. You don't spend time going down those snacks, the chips, the cookies, the crackers, the sodas, the juices. We don't have time for that. Once you know better, you do better, right? Now, last, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right, thank you, Mona. <laughs> um, last video about um, sugar. All right, last video. The single biggest threat to our health is the dramatic increase in the availability and the flood of sugar in all forms in our diet in the last hundred years. Hunter-gatherer populations consumed about 22 teaspoons of sugar a year. Today, the average American consumes 22 teaspoons of sugar every single day, and the average teenager consumes 34 teaspoons a day. Sugar has so many names, and all of them are harmful when eaten in excess. In fact, sugar is hidden in over 80% of processed foods and is called by over 200 different names. For instance, here are some of the innocuous sounding names for sugar. Agave nectar, barley malt, beet sugar, dextran, maple syrup, brown rice syrup, organic cane syrup. Since 1950, over 600,000 packaged and processed foods have been introduced into the marketplace. 80% of them are full of sugar, often tablespoons and tablespoons, hidden and disguised and called all sorts of secret names. It's in bread, it's in ketchup, it's in salad dressing. In fact, the average serving of Prego spaghetti sauce has more sugar than a serving of Oreo cookies. Your morning yogurt has more sugar than a can of soda. It's the main way the food industry makes tasteless processed food edible. And they're very good at hiding it and confusing you, often putting five or six different types of sugar, each with different confusing names. There are other white dangers, what we call the white menace. These are refined or processed foods that spike blood sugar, but we usually don't think of them as sugar. They're white flour. Even wheat or whole wheat flour or any kind of flour like white rice or white potatoes, all these things will jack up your blood sugar. All those things except the small heirloom or fingerling potatoes. These all act like sugar in the body and they should be kept to a minimum or substituted for better options in the green category under grains. Let's talk about dietary fat for a minute. For decades, we've been convinced that fat is the bad guy and that fat makes you fat and that it causes heart attacks. Instead of fat, we packed our diet with flour and pasta and rice and sugar of all kinds. Processed or refined grains have all the fiber and the nutrients stripped out of them and act just like sugar in your body. In fact, white flour is even worse than white sugar in causing blood sugar spikes and leading to cravings binging, and gaining of that dreaded belly fat. Now, since our government recommended low-fat diets in the 1980s, we have doubled our rates of obesity in adults. We've tripled obesity in kids, and we've increased our rates of diabetes around the world sevenfold. In America, one in two children have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Even worse, we've gone in just over 10 years from one in 10 teenagers with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, which is bad enough, to almost one in four. In Mexico, we now have one in 10 children with actual type 2 diabetes, what we used to call adult onset diabetes. We've seen the number of people with heart disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, dementia, depression, and infertility skyrocket. And the increases in these chronic conditions are due to one, primary cause, sugar, 
or anything that quickly turns to sugar like flour products and big starchy white potatoes and white rice. Now, I'm going to talk more about high fructose corn syrup later, but for now, I'm going to mention that fructose that's in the high fructose corn syrup turns on a cholesterol and fat production factory in your liver that's called lipogenesis that increases your LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, while lowering your HDL, that's the good cholesterol, and raising triglycerides, which are very harmful. This leads to a fatty liver. And that's a condition affecting 90 million Americans today, especially Latinos who have a gene that predisposes them to a fatty liver. We're seeing this even in five and 10 year olds now. And this is the biggest cause of liver transplants and liver failure, far surpassing alcohol or hepatitis. All of this increases something called insulin resistance. And that's where your cells become numb to the effects of insulin. And then you require more and more and more insulin to keep your blood sugar normal. Now, as your body makes more and more insulin, guess what? You get more and more belly fat because insulin is the fat storage hormone. And then you get more inflammation and you get hungrier. Why? Because those belly fat cells aren't just there holding up your pants. They're producing all sorts of chemicals and hormones, including the ones that make you hungry, gain more weight, and they produce something called cytokines. That's a marker of inflammation. And guess what? This inflammation is at the root of most chronic diseases. Now, even without getting type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance is the major cause of conditions such as heart attacks, strokes, many cancers like breast, prostate, liver, and pancreatic cancer, and colon cancer, and even dementia, which they call type 3 diabetes. Now, let's talk about the special case of fructose. For a long time, people thought fructose was the good sugar. It's the sugar found in fruit. And it does not raise your blood sugar, so it was thought to be good for diabetics. A whole agave industry has grown up around it, promoting it as a healthier, all-natural sugar. Unfortunately, the science is a bit more complicated. The bottom line is that all sugar and refined carbs are not good for us. Certainly not nearly the one pound of sugar and flour that the average American eats every single day. Now, we can tolerate them in small amounts and as an occasional treat, but we shouldn't be using them every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The only good source of sugar is real whole fruit, not juice or concentrate. And when it comes to eating whole fruit, remember it comes packaged with fiber, it's full of vitamins and minerals and plant compounds which are called phytonutrients, and that helps buffer out the fructose load. Let's take oranges for example. When you eat a whole orange, you're getting the nutrients that nature packed into it. You'll get vitamin C, of course, but you'll also get powerful bioflavonoids called hesperidin and many others. And you'll get about 3.4 grams of fiber in a medium orange. Now all of those things, especially the fiber, help buffer the orange's fructose load. But juice that orange and it becomes heavily processed. You strip away its fiber and you leave a big fructose surge that heads directly to your liver. Even so, compared to naturally occurring fructose, high fructose corn syrup is far more harmful. Now I've researched and written extensively about high fructose corn syrup, numerous problems. And what I found was shocking. Now while sugar in any form causes obesity and disease when consumed in pharmacologic doses, high fructose corn syrup is worse. And here's what we learned. High fructose corn syrup and cane sugar are not biochemically identical or processed by the body in the same way. High fructose corn syrup contains contaminants including mercury, that are not regulated or measured by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. Independent medical and nutrition experts do not support the use of high fructose corn syrup in our diet, despite the assertions of the corn industry telling us it's safe. High fructose corn syrup is almost always, and this is the most important fact, high fructose corn syrup is almost always a marker of poor quality, nutrient-poor, disease-creating industrial food products or food-like substances. When you see it on the label, it's usually a bad quality food. So I want you to avoid high fructose corn syrup at all costs. It's the single biggest source of calories in our diet, mostly from sugar-sweetened beverages, whether it's sodas or sports drinks or sweetened teas or even caffeinated drinks. If you do nothing else to change your diet, make this one change and be religious about it. No more high fructose corn syrup.
your life will never be the same and it will be better. Don't believe any health claims about improved or better sugars like agave or the food industry when they change the name of high fructose corn syrup to corn sugar to make it sound good. Now, what about artificial sweeteners, right? No sugar. Well, since sugar causes so many health problems, why not switch to artificial sweeteners and diet foods made with these alternatives? Well, here's the news. A new study, a 14-year study of 66,118 women, which was supported by many other previous studies, found the opposite seems to be true. Diet drinks may be worse than sugar-sweetened drinks. The study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition discovered some frightening facts that should make all of us swear off diet drinks and diet products for good. Among them, diet sodas raise the risk of type 2 diabetes more than sugar-sweetened sodas. In fact, women who drank one 12-ounce diet soda per week had a 33% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And those women who had a one large diet soda, like a 20-ounce soda per week, had a 66% increased risk. And guess what? The average diet soda drinker consumes three diet drinks a day. Now, in population studies, there was a 200% increased risk of obesity in diet soda drinkers. Now, some people might think that people who are overweight tend to drink more diet soda in a vain attempt to lose weight, and that that could explain the increase in type 2 diabetes. But the researchers took that into account, and regardless of body weight, the diet sodas increased your risk of getting type 2 diabetes. So what exactly is wrong with artificial sweeteners? Well, for one, they can be thousands of times sweeter than regular sugar, activating our genetically programmed preference for sweet taste more than any other substance known to man. They also trick your metabolism into thinking sugar is on its way. And guess what? That causes your body to pump out insulin. That's the fat storage hormone which lays down more belly fat. It also confuses and slows down your metabolism so you burn fewer calories every day. Artificial sweeteners make you hungrier, they make you crave even more sugar and starchy carbs like bread and pasta. And even worse, recent research has discovered that since artificial sugars cannot be digested by our digestive system, certain bacteria thrive on them. And those bacteria become bad bacteria, and they produce inflammation and molecules that cause weight gain and type 2 diabetes. Artificial sweeteners have no place in a healthy lifestyle, and I hope I've convinced you to permanently get rid of them. I hope you're beginning to see why I declare sugar public enemy number one for your health. You might want to <coughs> give up right now thinking about that, but you can have sugar. Don't worry. You can have a little real sugar. The natural sugars found in fruit and some veggies can taste incredibly sweet once you reclaim your taste buds from the hyper-sweet sugars we normally eat. In fact, life can still be very sweet without highly processed refined sugars and artificial sweeteners. If you focus on real food, foods that are naturally sweet, such as fruit and even veggies, you'll learn to enjoy them and you won't miss the junk. And if you try the junk, and you eat it again, it's gonna taste disgustingly sweet. If you're a sugarholic right now, you might be thinking, oh my God, there's no way I can give up sugar. But I've seen it happen over and over with my patients and thousands of people who read my books. Now, typically that transition happens within a few days. And after that, you'll find that formerly delicious foods that were sugary taste unbearably sweet. You'll begin to appreciate the natural sweetness of whole real foods. In fact, for most people, they can completely detox from sugar and flour in just 10 days. After 21 days, you'll have formed a lifelong habit of low sugar lifestyle. And your body will naturally regulate your intake. You won't be affected by all these cravings and hunger and out of control behaviors. You'll try things like roasted vegetables or sweet potatoes. Even kids love them. And dark chocolate is a wonderful healthy treat as long as you don't eat the whole big bar. When you follow our program, your sweet and carb cravings will go away. Your taste buds are going to wake up to the wonderful taste of real food and you won't feel deprived. And of course, there's always room for treats and sweets, but in moderation, not as staples. All right. 
So um, sugar, they've done some studies on sugar. And let me tell you, sugar is, is just as addictive as cocaine. And in most cases, it's worse. They've done brain scans on people and they, the activity after eating something sugary, the activity is, is more hyper than the brain scan of someone who just had heroin or cocaine. cocaine. In 1970s, the University of Massachusetts did a sugar study. And so what they did is they put this baby in a room and they had 22 doctors come into the room. And you know, all the doctors went up to the baby and they just said, oh, cutie, cutie, hello, hello, hello. Oh, look at the cute little baby. Well, one doctor came up to the baby and had a, a cloth, a piece of cloth that had some table sugar in it and just stuck the sugar in the baby's mouth just like, oh, look at you, you're so cute. You're just a cute little baby. And the baby tasted the sugar in, in the cloth and he said, like, oh, mm. and, and wanted more. Then the doctor took it away and left the room. So all the doctors left the room. And then the doc and so they came back in to the room after 30 minutes and they came back in the room and the baby was like, was looking like, oh, looking, looking. So all the other doctors would come up to the doc, to the baby, and, and the baby was like, I, 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 get out of my way, move, 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 move. And finally, the baby spotted the, I call it the pusher. The baby spotted the doctor who gave it the sugar. It was like, <laughs> and so they showed that sugar is more addictive than anything. And if you get sugar, you're going to always want to know where your source of sugar is. And they, you know, they, 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 they were just amazed at how the baby completely ignored everybody else in the room and just wanted to focus on the one who gave her the sugar. That's how addictive it is. And you can, and there's no weaning off of sugar. You just have to quit cold turkey. And like he said, it takes 10 days for your body to detox from sugar. So I made a commitment on you know, for 2021 that I was gonna, not gonna have any sugar except the sugar that came from fruits and from vegetables. And I did good until this past week when my pusher, Yolanda, <laughs> made a caramel cake and sweet potato pie. And she brought it in because uh, we had a lady who was leaving our studio, leaving the area, she's moving. So we wanted to send her off with a little goodbye. And um, somebody else brought in fruit. So I, I got a little piece of her, her caramel cake, like a little tiny piece, and I got a piece of the sweet potato pie, but I could not eat it. I couldn't eat either one. It was so sweet, tastes just like somebody just poured sugar into my mouth. And, you know, and I told her, I was like, this is really good. It's really good, but I just, I, I can't because I had, after 21 days, my body got rid of those cravings for sweets. And when I tasted that, I, I felt like <laughs> it, was we, it was the weirdest feeling that I had. But I was glad because I thought at first I thought, oh, man, this is going to trigger my, my cravings for sugar stuff. It's going to trigger. But it did not. It just basically said, oh, my, my, my taste buds have changed and they can't handle the sweets anymore. So that will happen for you. You just have to quit cold turkey. You know, um, people. Um, there are so many natural sugars. So your body can handle cane sugar because it comes from a plant, but it's still not good for you. But it can handle cane sugar rather than artificial sugar, sugars. Anything that's artificial, your body does not recognize it as food, doesn't know what to do with it. And so guess what? It gets stored as fat. Anything that your body doesn't recognize. Now, there are some natural sweeteners. Now you can find monk fruit sweeteners in the um, grocery store. And the monk fruit, is, it has no taste except it's sweet. Now, 100% stevia, it is from a leaf. And so that is okay. But you've got to find, and it has to say on the package, 100% stevia. Because now they're cutting stevia with other artificial sweeteners just to make it, you know, to make more of it. But you, if you train yourself to just eat plain whole foods without the additives, you can do it in a month. I mean, it literally takes 10 days before. Now I can tell you on the day three, 
on day three, I, I just wanted to get a bag of sugar and just pour it in my mouth. I was suffering from withdrawal. That, that's how strong it was. But then I pushed through uh, and I, I had a headache. I was like, man, this is, this is worse than when I gave up caffeine. When I gave up caffeine, I had a, a you know, caffeine headache for three days, but the sugar headache, it was so strong, but I, I pressed through it. I prayed, I had to pray. I was like, God, you gotta help me through this. You gotta help me through it. And I, and I made it through. And then after five or six days, I was like, okay, I don't, I don't crave anything sweet. That's, that's weird, that's bizarre. And then after 10 days, I it just, I didn't even have a, a craving at all for anything sweet. So now it's just like, you know, I don't, I don't want the cakes. I don't want the pies or the cookies. I don't need peanut M&Ms. That used to be my weakness. I, I can do without, but it's cold turkey. There's no such thing as, okay, well, I used to put three te teaspoons of sugar in my coffee. So now I'm going to break it down to two and then one because as long as you're giving yourself the sugar, your body's gonna crave it. Okay, high fructose corn syrup. If you don't remember anything else about sugar, high fructose corn syrup is the number one cause of diabetes in America and in the world now. There's a, um, there's a small little uh, tropical island, I forget the name of it, but um, it's off, it's like near Samoa and Hawaii over there. Um, but they got introduced, they had this missionary kind of com company come in there and they were supposed to help feed the people there, but they brought in all these fruit juices for the kids. And so now the kids are addicted to these, it's like, um, it's like this red fruit punch juice. And so the, the kids have lost their teeth and they all have diabetes and they're like, you know, you guys came here supposedly to save us, but you're really killing us off. And it's because the, the juice that they brought in was high fructose corn syrup. That was the number one ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. The, and, it, and you're gonna find it in, if you start looking at labels, you're gonna find high fructose corn syrup in jellies, in your, in your syrup, of course. When, unless you're getting pure maple syrup, that's the only kind of syrup I will ever eat is pure maple syrup. I can't do the Aunt Jemima and all that kind of stuff because the first ingredient is going to be high fructose corn syrup. You're going to find it in the cookies, the creams of the cookies. If you eat Oreo cookies, high fructose corn syrup. If you find that in anything that you eat, just get rid of it. It's just not worth it. Your health is not worth it. And, and to think that in most of the foods that we eat, if we eat processed foods, you're consuming about one pound of sugar every day. <laughs> it adds up, it really does, it adds up. All right, so that's about it, ladies. I hope you got some information that you can use. Um, if you have questions about any of the information or you run across something, feel free to reach out, feel free. You know, you can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm Rosa Seward, S-E-W-A-R-D. I have a, I do personal training. So I have Coach Rosa Seward is my professional page. And then I own Brick House Fitness Studio. So you can also find Brick House Fitness. We have a YouTube channel called Brick House Fitness. If you follow that channel, you'll find some information on food prepping, how to prep your meals. You'll find some information on our exercise classes. We've got some playlists you can follow along to our Zumba class from home. Um, so there's a wealth of information there. And if you live in the Stafford area, you are welcome to drop in at Brick House. We have a, a $10 drop-in fee. You can drop in and take a class. And if you don't live in the Stafford area, you can also take our classes online. We offer our classes for $5 per class online. And, and it's not just Zumba, we have Zumba, we have weight training, we've got kettlebells. Um, so we've got a, a, a lot of things to offer. I've got people who train with me who live in Canada. I have a client in South, uh, South Carolina, one in Florida, uh, two ladies in Maryland, um, all throughout Virginia. So um, we are available here to help you on your health and fitness journey. It's not just about fitness. 
It's health and fitness. And the health comes first. Okay. It's all good to be nice and trim and look good, but it's better to be fit and healthy. And then you look good at the same time. Okay. Rosa, thank you so much. Thank you, Yolanda. Hey, we have really enjoyed you. Tony had to get off, but uh, she told me to tell you she really enjoyed it. Great. We recorded it for the other ladies that couldn't make it. And yes. Yes. Thank you Good. so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate thank it. You. As you can thank see, you. I, I can talk about this stuff all day. I love it. <laughs> yes. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you all ladies so okay. much. Enjoy your weekend. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if you have any comments or you want me to clarify anything that you saw or read or heard during this presentation, I'm definitely available to help you. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank right. you. Thanks ladies. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, right. you know what ladies, we didn't uh, extended our time and other anybody have any closing comments? Okay, Cynthia, you want to close us out right quick? Yes, that's my eyes. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you what was just brought to us, um, Father. We thank you. We put it out in our hearts, our ears, and our eyes just open to receive it, Father. She even came from the word of God, how you intended us to be in the first place, Father. We pray, Father, that we now take this, build on this, and do what thus we are to do for our body, Father, the body you have given us, Father. We pray, Father, for, for, for the speaker of the hour who came and gave a rough time, Father, and just share with us, and then even say... We we can reach out to her. Father, that's a blessing, and we thank you for that. We thank you for our young ladies who joined us, Father. Again, may we build on this and share with others, Father, because our body was not meant for all this stuff that's going into it. So continue yeah. to bless, keep, and strengthen us, Father, through the uh, remaining of the weekend. We ask these in all things in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name. Let us say amen. 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 Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. well, that was good. Oh, you yes. stay down, Rosa. Good. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. I didn't know you. I have one question. The chart. Where Where can I get the chart? Because I don't. I didn't download it. Forgive me for just. I wanted to get that in before we. It's go. on there, Bernice. I'll make sure you see it. Okay. Yeah. Thank it's, you. So it's much. on the information. Okay. The lessons okay. one through seven are there, and then the charts at the bottom. Okay. okay. Good. I, didn't, I, was gonna ask I didn't drill thing. down enough. Yeah. yeah, you probably just didn't see it. It's there. Mm -hmm. yep. the, the chart is there. Yeah. Is that Eric coming downstairs? Bernice? <laughs> yeah, that's him. Yeah. Coming down. Tell him we all said hi. He's waving. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, thank you so, so much, ladies. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And I, again, you. I appreciate this opportunity for you all to let me come and talk about the stuff that I feel near and dear to my heart. I really appreciate you. I feel that this is what God wanted me to do. Um, and I'm, I'm, I love every second of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I, I think I need to turn it back over to someone, right? Uh, oh yeah you can turn it back over to me because if you log out then we're definitely done. yes okay hold on <laughs> okay i'm gonna leave it to the pam. pam okay, okay. thanks